Okay, hello and welcome, finally, to this live Google Hangout for the FutureLearn course Agincore 1415 Myth and Reality. Uh, my name is Kate Borthwick, I'm at the University of Southampton and I'm one of the designers of the course. I'm going to be monitoring your comments and your questions and putting them to our lovely and illustrious <laughs> panel. Uh, who are joining us from all over the place. Um, I do apologize for the technical problems we've had. We've been trying to get Professor Schnurb to join us from France and all our technical tests of course were brilliant and then today we can't seem to to hear what he says. Uh, so we're working behind the scenes to try and get him to join us and I do hope he can. While we're talking you can put your questions on the course step you can also put them on the YouTube window if you log in with a Gmail address. And you can also put them via Twitter using the hashtag FLAgencore. Uh, we've also got one of our tutors, Alex Labanov, who's behind the scenes. And he's going to be uh, putting comments in the chat window as well. So we've got uh, a large number of people here, people you can see and people you can't see. Uh, and of course, I've got Manuel sitting next to me, who's out coordinator of our tutors who's also helping out. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to hand over to our, our two, currently two panelists and ask you please can you introduce yourself and say hello. Hello, I'm Anne Curry. I'm Professor of Medieval History and Dean of Humanities at the University of Southampton. Although uh, today I'm actually in London, I've written quite a, a number of things about the battle, been very heavily involved with the Saint Historique at Azincourt, and I'm really delighted that so many people are interested in this course. Looking forward to your questions. And Tom? <laughs> Hello, I'm Tom Richardson. Uh, I'm the former Deputy Master at the Royal Armouries, based in Leeds and at the Tower of London. I uh, <clears throat> have been particularly interested in uh, English military supply in the 14th, early 15th century, and was one of the curators involved in the recent Agincourt exhibition at the Tower of London, and also uh, fascinated at the controversy uh, some of the uh, research that I've produced has caused and look forward to talking about it uh, during this chat. Okay, brilliant. Well, as I say, I mean, I've got lots of questions that people have been putting uh, throughout the course to, to put to you and burning issues. And I think we should probably kick off with um, the one of the biggest burning issues, which is about the number of arrows. Um, so we've had a lot of discussion from lots of different people um, after watching your video, Tom, where, where you and Anne talk about the number of arrows that each archer actually had with them on the campaign, I believe you say between 24 and 48, and people can't believe that. They, they can't believe there must have been um, more arrows that each archer had. Um, what can you say about that? Well, it would be lovely if they had an infinite number of arrows. It would be absolutely marvellous, and then they could shoot to the full capacity of the longbow. But what we discovered looking at the records of the Privy Wardrobe, the organisation that ran the military supply at the Tower of London uh, during the uh, second two-thirds of the 14th century, is that the number of arrows produced for a campaign was remarkably small. It was also remarkable that the numbers of bows, bowstrings and arrows uh, matches uh, where we have figures for the numbers of archers in a campaign almost exactly to a ratio of a bow, five bowstrings and two sheaves of arrows, that is to say two bundles of 24 arrows, that is 48 arrows. And for all the numbers, uh, where all the campaigns where we do have numbers of archers, those issues seem to occur. Now, we don't have any details because of the changeover in administration of the armory in the early 15th century. We don't have any details for the issues for Agincourt, which is really annoying. But we do have them. So we have so many detailed records in the 14th century uh, that it would be remarkable if anything different happened. Now, what I can't say anything about is what archers brought on their own, which wasn't recorded. They could maybe bring any number of arrows. We just don't have any record. But what's remarkable is the exactitude uh, where, uh, by which the issues from the Tower of London, uh, in the proportions I just mentioned, match the numbers of arch archers we've got on campaigns. 
Bob's there, there's, can I say one more thing, Anne, before you yeah, Certainly. There are also numerous occasions when uh, English archers are recorded as running out of arrows. Famous one being Towton. Uh, Poitiers too, Poissard records that they ran out and had to scurry around trying to find some more arrows. And another thing that we should bear in mind is that this kind of restricted supply of ammunition carried on right through into the late 17th century. I, it was normal for musketeers uh, during the mid 17th century to go into battle with 12 charges, 12 apostles of, of gunpowder uh, on their bandoliers. And when they shot those, they were out. And of course there was local resupply, but it was really fiddly to do. And in practical terms, once a musketeer had shot 12 shots during the English Civil War, they were out. I was going to add some comments about the way people fought. Folks have, have sent questions saying, but surely they'd use them all during the siege of Harfleur. Uh, there isn't much evidence of sorties by the garrison. In fact, none at all, really. It seems to be in a, a pretty sedentary siege. Uh, Quinty, the deeds of Henry V, quite a lot of um, uh, mentions of attacks on the various barbicans and, and sort of setting fire to things using faggots and uh, that kind of thing. There isn't really evidence of use of arrows during the siege. We might have expected some posses of archers to go out with their men-at-arms on horseback, maybe to get supplies. They might have loosened a few there, but I'm not sure they would have used many during the siege or during the march. For the Battle, by my calculations, we've still got seven to seven and a half thousand archers there. Even with 24 each, that's a hell of a lot of arrows to use. We've got obsessed in the modern world by how many you can uh, shoot in a minute. Maybe that's an irrelevant thing. It doesn't seem to have been the kind of thing that's, that's dominated studies until relatively recently. I think we must be looking at sort of volleys of arrows. Certainly the sky turns dark with them, but that wouldn't, be, wouldn't need you to, 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 to be shooting 10 uh, very quickly quickly. I think we have other ways in which arrows were used. I just wish we knew more about this, but I think we do need to suspend our judgment and to be cautious about they could shoot 12 a minute or more than, more than that. I'm not sure those are particularly relevant comments. Um, can I just say, as one of the comments was, um, would people have scavenged arrows? Would that have happened on the battlefield? We certainly know for other sieges later on that they would have gone to, to pick up what they could, and I see no reason why they wouldn't have done that afterwards. So far, on the traditional battlefield, with the field walking, metal detecting that's been done, not a single arrowhead has been found. Of course, that does raise uh, a question as to whether we're looking at the right battlefield, whether the battle really was fought in this traditional battlefield between Azancourt and Tramcor. And someone asked a question about, will there ever be fought? excavation we are hoping that before too long there will be a proper archaeological survey but it would have to be not just there but also in a, another couple of sites nearer to Maison Sale to the south and Rousseauville to the north probably where uh, it's thought the battle may have been fought so far we haven't got much to go on in terms of topographical or archaeological evidence for the battle actually being fought where it is claimed nowadays. I find that very very interesting personally, the fact that there's so much scholarship around uh, Agincourt but um, very little physical evidence of, you know, remaining and that's one of the interesting questions a lot of people have brought up. A lot of people ask that, that notion of will, will there be investigations, can there be investigations, they want to see that obviously happening. Mm -hmm. um, while we're on the topic of the archers, uh, we had a question from Robert about the archers in the woods, uh, which I think is mentioned in, in terms of the Tower of London diorama. Um, is there any record of the French trying to reach English archers if they were in the woods? Would archers have been in the woods? Because that seems a strange place to fire arrows from. 
Um, we have no evidence in the chronicles of French attempts to counterattack those archers. The mention of them, a, a group of 200 being sent round essentially behind uh, enemy lines, is in some Burgundian chronicles with the gloss that some people say it's true, other people don't. So we're not too sure whether it happened, but their purpose was really to goad the French from behind into attacking. There's quite a bit of evidence to suggest the French were slow in giving battle. I think they're still waiting for troops to arrive and therefore the point of sending this troop around the back was to go the French into a, a forward uh, move but as I say the Chronicles don't tell us really anything about what these archers did or French efforts to attack them. Okay, Tom is there anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, no, only that doing the model of the battle uh, you met, which you mentioned in the context of those little archers in the woods made it really very clear that the French, although the cavalry assaults on either wing were kind of aimed at the archers, the vast bulk of the French military effort was to take out the men-at-arms in the middle. Yeah. And they weren't that bothered about the English archers, or else they could have, one would think they could have sorted them out pretty easily with the number of men-at-arms they have. And yet there's this huge concentration on getting the king, uh, you know, Henry V and the English nobility with their infantry assault, their dismounted men-at-arms assault. The use of the archers really by Henry means that those French men-at-arms, some of them never get into the hand-to-hand the -hand fight because they are sort of cut down or they fall on top of each other, pile up even before they're able to get to the English lines, I think. Okay, we've got an interesting um, live contribution from Alice. Um, and I'm just going to uh, read some aspects of it. There's, there's a chronicle that denies the theory that 200 archers were sent to the woods at Tramacor and she's Lefebvre, I think. Uh, that's the one I mentioned where it says some men say it is true, others don't. I, that's what I say yeah. in the text. Uh, so she, the, the writer is not too sure whether it's true She goes on to say, how do historians decide which chronicle to believe and go with as the truth of the battle and which to not believe? Yeah, I think that's a very important point and I think a lot of popular works have not addressed that key issue. Many of them have just heaped together all of the chronicles, the best stories from each of them. It is a very, very tricky thing to do and that's why in my book on sources and interpretations I looked a lot at who the authors were, when the works first appeared, how they were used. Uh, at the end of the day we've got to use our judgment. One thing also that people may not realise is just how samey these chronicle accounts of battles are, that I've got some quotes for the Battle of Cressy for instance I've shown them to people and they said oh Agincourt I've said no Cressy, there probably aren't that many ways of, of fighting so it is a perennial problem, I can't give an easy answer to that except to say that's what the training as a historian is trying to do uh, really, the fact that chronicles uh, some chronicles mention the same thing doesn't mean to say it's true because they could have been dependent on each other the relationship between monstrous Lefebvre and Warren is a particular issue here. Okay, thank you for that. And just a final comment in there from, from Chris, who's saying um, he's agreeing, yes, we need to be cautious about relying solely on records available today and that various captains may well have supplied their own men with arrows. Um, would that have been the case? I presume that would have been the case. Um, we've got no evidence for it. Okay. Uh, the account of the uh, Earl Mar Marshall, I think, does not suggest that he was producing, providing arch, uh, arrows for his men. Okay. Mm. okay. There, seems, there seems pretty much to be a royal monopoly on <clears throat> uh, supply of bows and supply of arrows in England during the period of the Hundred Years' War. Okay. okay. But more, more research will help here, you know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If you're interested, then uh, try to find household accounts and that kind of thing. I mean, that's what Tom and I and other historians are trying to do all the time, you know. That's the beauty of history, that uh, there is always more to find out and more questions to ask. Uh, absolutely, and I think, um, you know, the questions that people have been putting on the course have reflected that. You know, there are things yeah. that we don't know at this point, but that doesn't mean tomorrow someone's not going to find the chronicle that answers that question and you know we can move on. So. No, well just to remind people about Bosworth that I was involved in that project and within a month of the end of it, three years funding, uh, cannonballs were found and other objects yeah. so I think the location of the battle will eventually be revealed. Yeah fantastic okay um, let's move on from arrows then um, 
Although, obviously, all those people out there that are still very uh, into this issue, keep, keep researching it, keep finding out more and sharing that information with us. Um, so in the course, we see lots of English documentation um, relating to the English Army. Are there similar documents for the French side? Obviously, P Professor Schnerb's not here to answer that, but perhaps you can comment on that. Yeah, there are, there are indeed. I'm just hoping my computer's not <laughs> going to run out of power before too long. Um, there are indeed. There are quite a lot of, of payments. Uh, uh, there are even muster lists for the army that gathered in Rouen in uh, September. And uh, I, so far, I've identified about 500... 50 dead from various sources, about 320 prisoners. I've got the names of about 1,500 other people I think could well have been at the battle. We're going to be trying by the end of March to put up some of this early evidence we have of uh, the French. Okay, related to that, I've had a question in from Jill who says she's been, you know, the muster rolls, there's the names of Welsh and Cornish people, and other places she's seen names of sort of German and Flemish and, and so on. What were there any mercenaries involved in the fighting from other countries? And if so, do we know how many? Um, I think that we don't see mercenaries really. Uh, you're getting people from Brabant and that uh, sort of members really of the uh, aristocracy linked to the French aristocracy. Um, we do, after 1415, there's quite a lot of Genoese uh, and uh, Spanish, I think, involved in the campaign to try to recover Harfleur in 1416, for instance. Later on in the 1420s, the French relied on a lot of Scottish troops, of course, the French and the Scots were in alliance with each other uh, at that point. The English um, may have had Portuguese support, very, very little of it though, and some Gascons in the, uh, the army. There is believed to be one Welshman known to have fought for the French at Agincourt. Maybe there were more. Okay, thank you. As um, I say, Kate, I am a bit worried I may be cut off in a minute. It said two hours to go. It now says seven minutes. So oh, no. Okay. My power. Um, <laughs> well, maybe just to say, if we lose you um, in the interim time, if you can find a cable to plug in and then rejoin us. Or go on another computer, absolutely. You know, no, we, we can you. find a way to go forward. Um, yeah. So we've, we've had a lot of interesting questions about the sort of campaign in, in general. And Tina... Tina said that what she'd learned from the course was that uh, the reasons for the expedition were at best dubious. The whole campaign, superb logistics, etc., was perhaps a shambles. England's win was due to failures on the French side. So, um, you know, what, what's our reaction to, the, to remembering Agincourt? So without Shakespeare, would we have forgotten Agincourt completely? What do you think? I I think we would have done, and I think that Shakespeare play has so much to answer for. It was wheeled out again in the 18th and 19th centuries when we were at war with the French. Uh, Agincourt, uh, people uh, remembered it through the words of Shakespeare, so when it was first mentioned as the day of St. Crispin on the 25th of October 1757, when we were at war with the French, the newspaper just quoted lots of chunks of Shakespeare, and people still hear that uh, in their ears rather than the, the actual battle itself. It does explain why it's Agincourt and not Grécy or Poitiers. After all, Poitiers, 1356, the French king was captured. So arguably that was more significant. Agincourt didn't lead to any immediate concessions by the French. Henry's success in becoming heir to the throne of France in 1420 by acceptance by the French uh, was all to do with the French Civil War. Essentially, it, the French fell in on themselves. The Dauphin was implicated in the murder of the Duke of Burgundy in 1419. And as a result of that, the Burgundians allied with Henry and he was accepted as Air and Regent of France. So it isn't directly linked to Agincourt. Shakespeare's play, of course, moves straight from 1415 to 1420, and I think that has misled people. Henry actually has a big campaign in 1416 to try to save and rescue Harfleur, which is successful, and then between 1417 and 1419, he conquers Normandy. So there's a hell of a lot of warfare. People are less interested in that, that period 1417 to 19, because there are no battles in it. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we've got uh, Bertrand um, on, on a sort of separate chat Skype, so <laughs> um, I, I can be feeding some comments uh, back from him. Um, and one of the things we've had, we've had a lot of interest in the, the French side, uh, the French story. 
Uh, and, and the question that someone's put is, with so many casualties, it was Clive put this question, with so many casualties on the French side, was it ever documented or researched how this affected civilian life uh, in France? Anne, do you want to answer that? <laughs> or Tom, maybe? Well, we seem to have had a... No, I, I don't... I, I would hope Bernard could... Uh, Bertrand could uh, help us with that. Okay, I think Bertrand will be a bit of a, a, a gap while he, he thinks about that and types yeah. in a response. Anne, have we still got you? You seem to have frozen momentarily. Okay, well, uh, let's move on to another question then. Um, this is something, um, Tom, yeah. um, someone's put a question through. Math Matthew has sent a question through um, about Tobias Capwell's new book, Armour yeah. of the English Knight. Um, what do you think of it? Can you tell us? It's a, it's, a, it's a new publication, I understand, relating to armour at the time of Agincourt. What can you tell us about it? Uh, yeah, uh, Toby's uh, new book uh, is um, one of the books that's come out of his uh, University of Leeds PhD, uh, which he did in conjunction with the Royal Armouries quite a number of years ago now. And uh, this is the first sort of published uh, output of it. And it's an absolutely excellent study. Uh, what Toby did, um, as well as looking at the material pieces of armour that survive uh, and, uh, and uh, manuscript illustrations and so on, is to do a very thorough survey of all the um, effigies which depict armour in great detail uh, in a way that had never really been done before. And by comparing details of the way in which armour is depicted in the effigies, he's shown that you can actually distinguish between different centres of manufacture in the armour that's depicted on the, um, on the effigies and suggesting that rather than producing generic armours for the uh, figures on the effigies, that artists are actually representing uh, very accurately uh, the, the armours that were worn by, or at least available to, uh, the, the men-at-arms as depicted. And so armed with all of that, uh, Toby's book really covers the first half of the 15th century um, and does so uh, in more detail and with, with more uh, published source material than any other publication on the subject. It's an absolutely excellent read and I recommend you all go out and buy it. Uh, available from Tom Del Mar's uh, Arms and Armour Specialist Auctioneers who have published it for Tom. Okay, I think I think you were going to wave a copy of it there, weren't you? I can I can do that <laughs> in front of the camera. <laughs> it's just out of reach, actually. <laughs> okay, well, um, as I say, just to update people, we've got Bertrand sort of uh, at length uh, through chat, and Anne, um, I hope, is will be trying to join us. I believe her computer is probably uh, uh, blown up, but <laughs> I think she'll still be trying to join us. Um, so, Tom. I yeah. wonder what your take on I mean, this question we've had in, when we remember Agincourt, are we remembering the battle, do you think, or are we remembering Shakespeare, or are we remembering Henry V? What do you think um, about that? Oh, yes. I, we, we, well, it's an amalgam of all those things, really, isn't it? I mean, it? It's interesting the way historical events, exactly what Anne was saying slightly earlier, the way historical events are sort of trotted in to um, help us with the present. Um, uh, another example of that is you see in museum display uh, where the, um, at the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars, when, um, the period when invasion of England by France is, is threatened with the Grand Armée massing on the coast with barges preparing to invade us, at the tower we put on a display of the Spanish Armada with Queen Elizabeth I addressing the troops at Tilbury to remind the populace that uh, last time a great fleet tried to invade England, um, we managed to beat them off by brilliant naval tactics and fight, fighting in that way. And if you look at the way in which Agincourt's remembered, it's quite often at a time when it's good to remind the English people that we're really good at fighting off uh, continental uh, foes. For example, the, the, the connection between uh, the, the <coughs> Uh, the film of Agincourt and the Battle of Britain and the Second World War uh, is uh, very, very close. 
and as Anne was saying, you know, it's a time of the Napoleonic Wars when we're reminded about it entirely, and, and, and previous wars with France, when we're, we're reminded of what went on through Shakespeare. So it, it's, it became, became a trope quite early on, and it's thanks to Shakespeare that happened, in my opinion. Okay, thanks very much. Anne, you've come back to us. Can you hear us okay? I, I can hear you, but can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Good. Ah, uh, good. We were just um, um, talking about a question about uh, what we're actually remembering when we remember Agincourt. Is it Shakespeare? Mm -hmm. Is it the battle? Um, is it uh, something else? <laughs> Uh, uh, well, I, I mean, I think it depends maybe who you are as to what you're remembering in in this. I mean, I think historians we would want to be remembering the sort of uh, the actual event itself and to have a curiosity about it, to want to explain why it happened, why it happened in the way it did, what its effects were. But I'm afraid I still feel that for many people there's a lot of jingoism involved in the remembrance uh, of the battle. You know, it gives them pleasure <coughs> to recall this sort of great moment of English success uh, if you like I think that's the the difficulty with it okay can I ask another question uh, changing the subject uh, again uh, from David we've had in the week this is about spies uh, we, mm -hmm. we had a lot of questions about this and Alex and I talked about this in the tutor review so David saying I would like to know if there's any hint of or knowledge of the English or French using spies during any part of the campaign and why wasn't this effective if there was uh, I think you've got to remember just what vast distances these armies are, are covering. Uh, it was quite difficult for the French to know where the English would land, but there is one very famous spy trial conducted by the French subsequently of a canon of Notre Dame called Jean Fusoris, who was accused of spying for the English. He'd been in England, uh, he'd met with Bishop Botany, Richard Court. Bishop of Norwich, friend of Henry and very important in the financing of the campaign. In fact, Richard died at the siege of Harfleur, but Fusoris was later later tried uh, for um, uh, uh, you know accused of of assisting the English. Essentially, they would have used spies. We know as well that they captured prisoners. The English captured prisoners. The guest to Henry. Kik Twinty tells us that as they got south of Corby, uh, Henry discovered from some French prisoners that the French had a plan which was to override the English archers, i.e. to send a cavalry charge against them. And uh, as a result of that, uh, he ordered the archers to prepare stakes to protect themselves. So we might imagine there, uh, you know, prisoners maybe being forced to give up information. We don't hear about torture in those circumstances, but you've got to say, well, did the French give up, did these prisoners give up the information readily or not? Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, uh, moving on, I've got another question for you, again from Andrew here. Um, particularly for you, Anne, and it's about, can you describe an element of the battle where your studies have changed our interpretation um, of the battle? And if there's, an, if there's a new idea that has updated information in recent years. So how have you seen things change, I guess, uh, in your research work? This is a question for me again. It's uh, for you, yes, yes, it yes. It is, yes. Well, I mean, it was quite interesting. When I started my work on Agincourt in the late 90s, really, somebody told me we can't know the names of the archers. This is because of the uh, belief that the only document we had with names of people present on the English side was the document known as the Agincourt Roll. This was a copy of a now lost original made in the late 16th century. The three versions of it, but essentially all the same. In fact, my work showed that in the National Archives we had many more uh, lists of soldiers both setting out for the campaign and also post-campaign lists saying uh, what had happened to them on the campaign. So uh, I think that my work has really transformed our knowledge of the actual participants in the campaign. Um, 
unfortunately there is a difference between how the men were recruited we know that they were recruited in companies mixed companies of men at arms and archers we can't know how that translated to fighting on the battlefield for instance were Sir Thomas Erpingham's archers just to take an example 60 of them were they grouped with other people's archers or did they just stand around and protect their own captain given that so many men came along in person or with a couple of archers it seems likely that there were uh, some fighting groups organized that are not quite the same as the administrative and recruitment groups. That is a great difficulty we have in uh, this information. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we, we put a question sometime earlier to Bertrand, and he's now answered, he's rapidly typing on Skype. So uh -huh. the, question, the question we put to him was, was, with so many casualties on the French side, was it ever documented or researched how this affected civilian life after the battle? And I'm just reading what his, his response here. He says, we have some documents about the impact of the battle on some noble families. We have some details about widows and orphans. An example of a widow is the example of Catherine Doxy, who lost her husband and two of her brothers in the battle. An example <laughs> of uh, an orphan is Beatrice of Waverin. She lost her father, Robert, Lord of Waverin, and her only brother, and she became the only heiress of her father. Um, and she married Gilles, Lord of Burlet, and this nobleman, and had to take the name and coat of arms of the Waveran family, Waveran family to avoid the extinction of its name. Um, we know that widows concentrated many lands in her, in her hands, and there were many new weddings after Agincourt, <laughs> apparently, uh, in France. Uh, so thanks, Bertrand, for that, for that response. And he's also added, I could add that some noble families were almost annihilated. The ducal family of Bar and the noble family of Crayon, for example. Um, and, the, and these facts are well known, so there obviously was a huge impact in, in France. Um, on that note, we had a question in, let me find it, from Fiona, just to everyone really. What provision was there made on the English or the French side for widows and orphans as a result of the battle? Um, I, I don't think there's, you'd expect anything uh, sort of different, but one interesting thing is that Henry V allowed the wages for the whole campaign, even for men who had died at the battle. And that means we don't know how many English died at the battle. That would mean that their executors would have been able to collect pay or to be entitled to pay uh, at the sixpence a day for archers, a shilling a day for men at arms for the whole campaign. Maybe it was aimed at uh, uh, that. In France, there are certainly cases as well, and I'm sure Tron would, if he had opportunity, said more about them, of men who were missing believed dead and that was a very difficult situation as it is in modern warfare where widows could not get access to the inheritance because it wasn't clear whether their husband was dead or not. There is a pardon to a man who was going round with a, a selling information supposedly from a list of prisoners <coughs> that it's not clear <coughs> whether it was a a justifiable list of prisoners or whether he was just giving out false information, maybe false hopes as well. So as Bertrand said, the disruption in French noble and gentry families was substantial. There's been work done by someone at the University of Bordeaux to plot all of these names on a map to show that the loss of life from the gentry and nobility in, say, up Normandy, uh, Picardy, Artois was particularly high. It's not a national effect for the French but very much a local effect. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we've had a, a question in from Charlotte saying, um, other than the obvious reasons like Shakespeare's play and the recent anniversary, why is Agincourt remembered? Are there other battles in the Hundred Years' War which have been so thoroughly studied and commemorated? Tom? Um, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, essentially, I <coughs> excuse me. Um, essentially not, because Agincourt has the Shakespearean link, which we've talked about uh, before. 
before and it seems to mean something more than just the events of the 25th of October 1415. Um, there has been more work done recently on Cressy and there's a dispute there as to whether where it was uh, fought but it, 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 the, the English success of course at Cressy didn't lead to negotiations either. Uh, it led to the uh, capture of Calais by Edward III, but remember that took a year, a year-long siege, so that battle didn't give him, give him an immediate advantage against the French. In 1356, a much smaller English army under the Black Prince captured John II, King of France, and that is absolutely crucial. It forced the French to negotiate, and they gave up essentially half of France to the English there. But within nine years, there'd been a, a change of king in France. Uh, the, the King of France, then Charles V, uh, had lawyers advise him that that treaty of 1360 that had given so much land to the English wasn't a valid treaty and therefore the war started again. The French were able to invade English held territories very quickly uh, and the English were not expecting attack and therefore lost these areas uh, extremely quickly. So those two battles are significant in historic terms, Poitiers more significant in terms of decisive battle, but maybe because the English lost things very quickly, that's another reason why they have not been so remembered. I think it's Henry V himself, Tom, I don't know what you feel about it. He's a much more glamorous figure than Edward III. Yeah, he, he does seem to be more glamorous, so certainly in the way in which he's remembered. Um, and. Uh, it, it's remarkable, really. I mean, Cressy is, in a sense, the much bigger, more dramatic battle, but we don't remember it anything like as much. I mean, it's transformative in the way in which uh, war was fought in northwestern Europe. Um, I mean, it, it's sort of the end of the great cavalry charge uh, for three or four generations um, because of the success of the English longbows over French cavalry. And what's, what's remarkable is that the French continue to use cavalry against uh, English armies of longbows and ultimately succeed. They don't at Agincourt, but they do after that. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, it's very, very interesting how it's part of a continuum, really, of engagements and by no manner of means the largest of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank it's you quite important to note that Charles VII's military reforms in the 1440s included the raising of many more longbowmen. So the French realise that perhaps they've got to beat the English at their own game. And the Franc Arche remains significant. It's probably some of those that come over to help Henry Tudor in his attempt to take the throne in 1485 and to win the Battle of uh, Bosworth. Uh, but I think also gunpowder artillery is significant. I think the final battles of the war, Formigny in 1450 and Castillon yeah. in 1453, the French have the advantage of substantial field artillery. Yeah. Okay, while we're um, talking about the Hundred Years' War in general, We've had some people, Tom, asking yeah. about the the model the, which we feature in the Tower of London video. Um, and I understand that model's moving to you in Leeds at the Royal Armouries, and it's going to be part of a bigger exhibition. Could you say something about that? Do you know when that's going to happen? Uh, yeah, that that's due to open in the Royal Armouries in Leeds at, uh, towards the end of May. I do, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact date for it. Uh, but it'll be a, um, a partial redisplay of the War Gallery at uh, the Royal Armouries Museum in Leeds, for anyone who knows it, uh, which will involve the whole of our medieval uh, display being uh, redone and incorporating the model from the exhibition, uh, which will sit actually, in a way, alongside our other famous battlefield model, the Sibborne model of the Battle of Waterloo, uh, which forms the, the sort of other end of that story of England fighting France in years ending with 15. Okay, thank you. I mean, um, people who are watching, if you have the chance to go to Leeds um, and to visit the Royal Armouries, it's a fabulous museum and, the, and if you see the model there, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, and so, um, you know, tell us on Twitter what you think of it and, and your experience of that you, down the line when you can go and visit that, that model there. I've got a response from Bertrand. Um, so we put a question to him on, on Skype from Anthony saying, why did the French get so much wrong? At Agincourt, 
Um, and Bertrand has responded. Uh, the French did not make many mistakes during the campaign, but there were many tactical mistakes on the battlefield. My opinion is that the French army had no real leader, and uh, it's Bertrand's opinion, and it could be contested, the only French prince who had the experience of a pitched battle at this time was the Duke of Burgundy. But the Duke was excluded from the royal government and did not join the army before Agincourt. Um, so, Anne and Tom, what, what do you think of that situation? So, what did the French get wrong? Did you know how did they get so much wrong? Bertrand has said it's about tactical mistakes on the battlefield. Yeah, I agree with that. The commander on the day was the Duke of Orleans, only 21 years old, but the sort of leading royal, if you like and uh, he had no military experience. It's clear there are divisions amongst the French, and it's easy to be wise after the event. But a number of French chronicles say there was a debate between the headstrong young men, like Orleans and Bourbon, uh, against the older men, Dalbray and Boussicot, the consul and marshal who urged caution against the English. After all, there had been plenty of English soldiers. The Burgundians had used quite a lot of English archers and men-at-arms in the civil war against the Armagnacs, they know how effective the English could be and therefore they're not necessarily too keen to give uh, battle. But the other thing I'd say is that there is no way you can train an army against a barrage of arrows. Tom, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um. <coughs> Yeah, I, th there's, a, there's a school of thought that because of this lack of military experience among the French leadership, that, that a lot of them um, seem to feel that they're going to a chivalric tournament with the English, where it's all going to be very glorious and there will be a glorious victory. Um, and that didn't quite turn out that way. Uh, but there, there does seem to be an element of um, chivalry kind of telling its own story and convincing the people who should be fighting a serious military campaign that in fact it, it was all going to come out like in the fairy story. And I think um, French military efforts after Agincourt maybe become a bit more grounded and sensible. And as Anne has said, the, um, <clears throat> Uh, the, the use of the con increasing use of gunpowder artillery both on the field uh, and off uh, becomes became the deciding factor ultimately in the war. Okay, thanks for that. Can we move on to some questions about Henry V? Because um, a couple of people have, have mentioned this. For example, Marion has said, what else did Henry do after Agincourt to deserve the reputation he's got? Does he deserve the reputation he's got? Can you say something about that? <laughs> well, I think Henry V is a great spin doctor as well. He maximized the advantages of his victory, particularly at home. He'd not been so secure on the throne in advance. He'd had uh, a plot against him, even as he was about to set sail from Southampton. But his reign becomes uh, a very militarized reign. Remember that after 1417, the middle of 1417 through to early in 1421, Henry is absent from the kingdom. He is obsessed, really, by his campaign in France. And he does conquer Normandy. So there's another achievement, an um, amazingly uh, uh, successful campaign, systematic conquest of a territory that has a lot of fortified centers in it castles such as Falaise, which you can visit still today and see just how well defended it was, and towns such as Rouen, Rouen, which was besieged for six months, the largest place ever taken by siege in the whole of the Hundred Years' War period. So Henry has some other military successes uh, to his name. But work on Henry V by Christopher Almond and in a forthcoming important book by Malcolm Vale to be published by Yale University Press press, suggests that Henry was a very impressive individual. He was into absolutely everything. He tried to reform the Benedictine monasteries during his reign. He was very active in the papal schism. For instance, he has the emperor visit him in England in 1416, that he was a very clever person, a great intellectual, someone who kept great tabs on what was going on in government. In Malcolm Mercer's book about him, which is Documents 
from the National Archive collections about Henry V, there is a memorandum list of sort of things to do, rather like we, we all put, you know, uh, sort of uh, remember to, to write to Inland Revenue or sort of write book or uh, article due next month, that kind of thing, similar kind of list. Henry's annotated it himself and the range of business that he is dealing with is uh, phenomenal. So it'd be a pretty impressive CEO of a modern company, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Tom, have you got anything you'd like to add about Henry and his, uh, mm. his spin doctor skills? <laughs> uh, well, uh, only to echo exactly what, what Anne said, and al also to note that um, <clears throat> um, rebellion wasn't long ago. The Battle of Shrewsbury was only 12 years ago at Ashincourt. And the the fact that Edward III had been so successful is large is largely connected, I suspect, at that time in the public mind in England, uh, with his military success. And so, being on the continent in France, winning battles was very important to being a good king in England in the early 15th century. Okay, thank you for that. I mean, related to this, we've had a question from Lauren. Um, it's quite long, so bear with me. After the battle, King Charles married his daughter Catherine to Henry and named him or Henry's heir as his heir. Henry was still campaigning against the French when he was married to Catherine. Why is this, as he's married to a French princess and has been named as heir? And also, how would Catherine have felt, do you think, about her husband fighting her own people? Where would her loyalties have been? Do we know? Mm -hmm. I think what's missing in uh, that interpretation is the French Civil War. Um, it's Shakespeare's fault again. He takes us straight from the Battle of Agincourt to the marriage to Catherine. In fact, Henry has to invade again in 1417. And what then happens is the French try to unite against him, but they can't because of this great division between the Burgundians and the Armagnacs, or Orleanist group. Of course, the Orleanists are damaged by the fact that the Duke of Orleans has been captured and is a prisoner in England. So the leader of the Orleanist group by 1419 was the Dauphin Charles, not the same Dauphin as was round in 1415. In fact, there was another one in between, but Charles. And Charles was involved in the murder of the Duke of Burgundy. That murder occurred on the bridge at Montereau. It was meant to be a reconciliation, a kind of east-west prisoner exchange almost, a shaking hands on the bridge that will unite against the French. It went terribly wrong. And the Dauphin, the Dauphin's henchman, uh, assassinated the Duke of Burgundy. That meant that the Burgundians, who at that point controlled Charles VI, the Queen Isabeau and Princess Catherine, allied with Henry. And so it was through that uh, factionalism, if you like, and Henry exploiting that, that he was able to negotiate a treaty with Charles VI in 1420. He put forward very serious demands for that treaty. Essentially what he's doing is protecting Charles, if you like, against the Orleanists, he's allying with the Burgundians who control the king at that point. And so when Henry marries Catherine and is accepted as heir and regent by that Treaty of Troyes in 1420. He is fighting for the King of France. That treaty has a clause in it saying that he will restore to Charles VI, he will continue fighting until every area that is held by the Armagnacs is recovered. So in fact he's fighting in the name of Charles VI because he is his heir and his regent. Uh, of course, it's the division within the French royal family, we must imagine here, but that is the, the, the reason for all of this. Now, no doubt Catherine would have been as upset as many people in this division within France itself because that is what allows the ancient enemy, the English, to such a, an advantageous position in France. Okay, thank you for that. And um, uh, currently, Manuel next to me is putting that question to Bertrand as well to, to see what, what he might want to add to that. Um, Anne has sent in a question about um, history in schools, actually. Does the panel think that enough is taught in schools about the Battle of Agincourt? What, what do you feel about that? Tom, do you want to take that first? Um, yeah. Um, what I think personally, is that not enough is taught about world history in general 
uh, in schools uh, because of the way history studies are, are structured. Um, most students who are looking at it in secondary schools in particular are looking at England in the 19th and 20th century and really don't get much of a much of a look in at the Middle Ages at all, let alone world history, and to get some Asian history on the curriculum so that we all knew when the Tang Dynasty was, for example, might be a really good thing now. So I think it's a wider question than a, a studying Asian core at school. I think there's a whole uh, question of looking at world history and how it's treated, personally. And of course it does raise interesting points with the current EU uh, debate. I think we do have to understand Britain's sort of relationship with Europe, one of antagonism in the past and then one of peace really in the, uh, uh, the present. I think maybe to understand the development of the English monarchy as well, it's quite important to look at wars like this. There is a direct link between the origins of our parliamentary democracy and warfare because the kings needed money to go to war and from the end of the 13th century onwards, from the reign of Edward I, in order to go to war they needed the commons in parliament to agree to taxation and that's just such a fundamental thing. By contrast in France the king could levy taxation arbitrarily. You might have thought that gave the French an advantage, however they had to wait until there was a situation of emergency. So in 1415, Henry can plan ahead for the campaign and get parliamentary consent and support for his campaign. Charles has to wait until Henry's actually landed in France before he starts collecting taxation in order to raise an army to resist him. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We've got a quite a specific question coming in, um, coming from Otto saying, uh, the killing of the Christian prisoners presumably after the battle was over. Uh, did Henry V break any kind of church law in enacting the way he did? Hmm. I think here we've got to remember there was a concept of the just war, but that is why in advance of the campaign Henry had put forward uh, claims, he'd gone into negotiations, he'd sent an ultimatum, if you like, to the French, and so he could say the French were depriving him of his rights. He then invades, claiming to be King of France, and therefore he claims he has the rights of uh, the Christian King of France behind him. Moving specifically to the battle itself, I think that Henry is so keen to protect his own army that uh, when he feels it's going to be attacked again and clearly by that time he's allowed his men to take off some of their armor, they're certainly through the heaps of the dead for prisoners, what other choice has he? Uh, he would see his own men uh, uh, killed uh, he therefore has to order the killing of the prisoners. It was not unique, it had happened at Al Jubarota, battle between the, uh, the Portuguese and the Castilians in 1385. And in the period itself, there is no evidence of criticism of Henry in the, uh, the writings or in any um, religious context. It's quite interesting here, there was a church council going on at this time at Constance and you might have expected that to have commented on it. It doesn't, it doesn't at all. Uh, so therefore I think it's the sort of thing that offends modern sensibilities but we must remember it is still within a battle situation and any commander would protect his own army come what may. Okay thanks for that. Um, um, Tom have you got anything to add to that? Uh, yeah I think that what Anne says is right. Um, I think it's a, it, it, it would appear at the time to have been a military necessity. Uh, what, what's you have to remember is that there are a staggering number of um, men, French men-at-arms who were by that time prisoners of the English and actually finding the resources to look after them was something Henry really couldn't do and w w with the idea that another um, <clears throat> whole group of uh, French soldiers were arriving on the battlefield there was a very very serious threat uh, of 
the English army being attacked from the rear as well as from the front. Okay, okay. We've got uh, a lot of people obviously thinking about the future and future research and what we're going to find out. And um, Duane has come in and said, "What are the major barriers to the continuation of archaeological digs to locate the actual battlefield?" I think there's a, a frustration that we can't go and dig the place up and find out more. Uh, what's mm. your take on that? Uh, well, arranging archaeology, uh, there are two things. One is cost. People don't realize just how expensive archaeology is. And the second is getting permissions. We're dealing with a large number of landowners here. It is agricultural land. And also, uh, the two th put the two things together. You're not going to actually carry out archaeological work, certainly not actual digging, until you've done a lot of survey work first to see where it is worth carrying out more expensive excavations. Thank you for that. I mean, I think we're uh, we're coming to the end now, really, of our time. We've uh, although we started late, we, we've we've gone on much longer, I think, than we meant to. Um, can we just perhaps close with one question, which is really about what we started with in terms of this live session, which what makes a decisive battle? And we've had um, you know questions in there. Does Agincourt deserve to stand out as a great English victory, like Waterloo or the Battle of Britain? Was it? Can we describe it as a decisive battle? I don't think it was decisive at all. A decisive battle led to an immediate result. Like Cressy, it was such a humiliation for the French, they weren't going to come to the negotiating table. Furthermore, the divisions in France, uh, it really was bad for the Armagnac party. They were the main prisoners. Uh, quite a few key Burgundians had been killed, but not the Duke of Burgundy himself. And you could argue that it gave the Duke of Burgundy an advantage in the Civil War because it uh, sort of damaged the Armagnac uh, party so much. So it encourages the Civil War in France. But most importantly, the French thought would be able to get Harfleur back. And in 1416, they besieged Harfleur by land and see. And that could have been quite a serious thing. In fact, we know that the Earl of Dorset, who was the captain of Harfleur, uh, wrote back to Henry in the early months of 1416 saying, if you don't rescue me soon, I'm going to abandon Harfleur. So that is the real test. And it is a campaign. Henry raises an army of seven and a half thousand in 1416. In fact, it is sent as a naval expedition, and it wins a battle on uh, the uh, in the <coughs> excuse me, in August uh, 1416. And that battle of the Seine, you could argue, is the really decisive battle. Without that, had Henry lost half Fleur, yeah. He couldn't then invade it again in 1417 and undertaken the systematic conquest of uh, Normandy. So I don't think Agincourt is decisive. It seems more because of its post-history, particularly from Shakespeare onwards and also even down to the present day with the Olivier films uh, and the plays, but also the way Agincourt has got into our national uh, psyche. It is the only medieval battle, I think, where, for instance, you can have Agincourt solutions as a management company, Agincourt power cleaning, Agincourt care homes. There's no other battle that's come to that. And I think that has, has made us think it must have been more significant in 1415 than it was. Okay, thank you. Tom, have you got so, any thoughts to add to that? To be a decisive battle, uh, a battle has not only to be conclusive on the field, but also have major political ramifications. And that ultimately uh, is, uh, uh, so decisive battles are only decisive with hindsight. If they achieve political a aims, achieve major political changes, then they're decisive. If they didn't, however conclusive they were, they're not, and Ashen Court wasn't. Okay. Okay, brilliant. That's a, that's a nice spot to end. I've got one last comment from Bertrand, which is not related to that question. It's related <laughs> to a much earlier question. When we talked about Catherine of France and where her loyalties lie, uh, he says, Catherine of France was married in 1420 at the time of the Treaty of Troy. The treaty was a treaty of peace, and her marriage with the King of England was an essential fact, creating a new alliance between the two kingdoms. And we have to remember that Catherine was not the first princess married to a prince who was a former enemy of her family. 
Uh, so, you know, I think it's the, the lot of the royal woman in medieval times to experience well, these uh, Perhaps I can just add in, add in a, a physical manifestation of that at her coronation banquet in uh, Westminster in uh, uh, February 1421. There was a table decoration. And it had on it a little rhyme, uh, par ce mariage pur la guerre ne dure, by this pure marriage war will cease. So I think it's it's uh, emphasis as a marriage of peace and the idea that the heir, uh, the eventual Henry the Sixth, was descended not only from Edward the Confessor, the great saint of Westminster, but also Saint Louis. They thought in 1420 that the future was very rosy with a double monarchy in prospect, a union between England and France. Of course, the history of Europe has been very different. Okay, thank you. That seems like a good a good spot to end. Um, thank you very much to our panelists, and thank you very much to all those people out there who've been watching and putting your comments on uh, and your questions. We haven't been able to answer everything, and I'm sorry about that. But we've still got a few more days of the course, so keep putting your ideas on there, and our tutors will be dealing with them. I do hope you've enjoyed the Agincourt course as a whole. We've certainly very much enjoyed it, uh, and we hope to see you again next time we run the course. Um, and a lot of you have made recommendations for us on courses you'd like to see, for example, about the Hundred Years' War, about Henry V. Keep those coming, uh, and we'll see if we can uh, make those happen. Um, and I do hope you continue your interest in Agincourt. So thank you very much. Goodbye from me, and uh, goodbye from our panellists. Bye-bye. Goodbye. 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 goodbye.